The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. So we are here for our third annual, we've, this is our third year doing this, Oscar lead up, Oscar preview with Variety's own Janelle Riley, one of my best friends in the world and somebody who interviews literally everyone. Do you do a tally, Janelle? Do you like say, here are all the people nominated for the Oscars and do you have like a bingo card? How do you do it? You interview everybody. Yeah, I mean, well, um, it's mostly actors and directors, so I, I can't really look at a bingo card and look at, you know, sound mixers or things like that. Although I do talk to a lot of those yeah, people. Yeah, you do. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I missed anyone this year. I think I've gotten them all except for maybe like, no, no, I think I've pretty much gotten them all. Do you have a collection of selfies, uh, you know, on your Instagram as well? <laughs> no, too? Here I, I oh. actually find that incredibly obnoxious. I think um, <laughs> it's, but I say that being in a fortunate position where usually there's a house yeah. photographer who gets a shot of me with someone. So it's very easy for me to say that. I think it's really cool when like an interviewer someone is really special to them and they grab a selfie together you know and you can see they're really excited like I can count the people that I have asked probably on on two hands but when you see them doing it with everyone or the person's trying to eat or it's on an award show it's like I would rather have a nice moment to speak with that person than yeah. to get some sort of photographic evidence which can be faked anyway by the way they're all deep fakes yeah I could I can photoshop myself in with hum- Humphrey Bogart you can't stop me <laughs> I, I seem to remember a story, though, that I think Ben told me, and you can tell me if this is true or not, where, you know, you like beckoned to to Ben, like, come over here, come over here, come over here. I want to introduce you to someone. And then that someone was Steven Spielberg. Well, yes, but Ben was in the room and like it wasn't like I, I pulled Steven out from behind a curtain. <laughs> I was like, and then ben hey, Steven, stop talking to your kids. <laughs> and, and, uh, didn't, didn't Ben like immediately become a total fanboy and like pull was, out a camera and take his picture with, no, with Steven? No, 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 there was no oh, photo. <laughs> He, ben <laughs> was Ben was very cool. The the most oh. I have ever seen Ben geek out, and like I just saw like his face light up, and you know the, like this little boy was with Sparks. Oh, when I yeah, that's him to true. Sparks. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was actually a little surreal because like I I sort of stepped away for a minute to talk to someone, and I came back two minutes later, and Ben still had the sim same big look so on excited. his face. Yeah, ten mile wide smile. Yeah, it was, was insane, unbelievable. And then excited. afterwards, Starstruck. he was saying like he couldn't believe they just stuck around and talked to people. He's like. It's like, that's Sparks right there, you know? Yeah. Why, why aren't people, like, like hounding them? That's Sparks. <laughs> For Annette, which which unfortunately didn't get uh, as We've much Oscar such love. Such a bummer. Such yeah. a bummer. I loved that movie. And I uh, the song should have been a shoe in especially mm-hmm. considering some of the things that got nominated. The Sparks Brothers not getting nominated for Best Documentary, documentary uh, blows my mind. Always messed up. Always messed up. Mm-hmm. I don't even think it made the short list, did it? Uh, you actually told me when the shortlist was happening that it didn't, yeah. and so it wasn't going to get a nomination. And I'm like, how is that possible? I understand that, you know, it's it's a documentary about a rock band. It's not creating world peace. But I also have to say that there's I've probably not rewatched any movie from the last five years as many times as I've watched that documentary. It, it And I love Edgar Wright's movies, and it's probably my favorite Edgar Wright movie by far. They always do this, like, the, the most, like, populist or well-known documentary always gets snubbed. You know, the Fred Rogers documentary yeah. didn't make the short list. Oh, yeah. It happens every year. They're so predictable. So I had a bad feeling it wasn't going to make the short list. It makes me sad, but I think they're all doing well. Uh, you know, like Alicia and I went and saw Sparks at Disney Concert Hall uh, and it was like sold out two nights in a row and they're doing a humongous monster tour. And I think that that documentary is part of the reason why there's a resurgence in interest in them. And then Annette, which again, I think got the shaft. It should have been nominated for something. I, I would not have been sad to see it on the list of uh, of best cinematography, the, the stuff we're here to talk about. Yeah, or even score, or um, yeah. I thought Marion Cotillard was fantastic if you put her in the supporting Amazing. category, especially. So yeah, I mean, I love that movie, so I thought I thought the whole thing got screwed. Yeah, I do think that uh, weird movies are at a disadvantage, and that movie definitely dabbles in some hardcore surrealism, and that might have worked against it, you know, like because it's like 
it's 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 not that all the movies are super big mainstream movies, but they're movies with mainstream kind of appeal. And Annette to me is more of a niche appeal movie because it's so odd. But that's what makes it wonderful. Yeah, but then sometimes the Academy just goes for odd. I mean, Parasite wasn't really what people would consider an Academy movie, but you know, I guess we did that a couple of years ago. So now we got to play it safe for a while. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, let's dive in and go over uh, the list, the list of, of five movies. And uh, Ilya and I have talked about this. We're, we're quite proud on the podcast that we have spoken to three of the five nominated cinematographers. Uh, Sadly, so those... a decline from last year where we had four out of five. And the two that you haven't spoken to, I have. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So I'll go in uh, in order of people we haven't spoken to, starting with them. The amazing Janusz Kaminski for West Side Story. And uh, Bruno Dubonel for The Tragedy of Macbeth. Ari Wegner for The Power of the Dog. Dan Lautzen for Nightmare Alley. And Greg Fraser for Dune. All of them are stunning, amazing works. I I, I, misspoke. I've spoken to all of them except for Dan. Really? Yes. Well, by the time that this airs, because I'm doing something with Ari this weekend, and I Uh. met her at a luncheon where she was lovely. And I actually felt a little bad for her because everybody was coming up to her and saying like, you know you're going to win, right? You're going to make history. I, I think she, well, we'll, we'll get to yeah. that. But, I, but like, what, I, what, are you, what are you supposed to say to that when somebody tells you that? You know, she can't be like, yeah, I know. You know? Oh, you, you could say, thank you very much. Yeah. I sure hope so. You yeah, could say, I, in your face, patriarchy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things, is let, let's start kind of talking about Ari Wegner. You know, when we had uh, Rachel Morrison on the show a few years ago, we interviewed her. And then like two weeks later, she was the first woman ever nominated for Best Cinematography. And I remember because I was still the one editing the episodes at that time, I scrambled to edit it and get it out like hot on the heels of the Oscar nominations because we weren't lucky to have uh, Ben Katz who edits for us now. And so it was always slow ass me editing these things. It was Um, slow ass Ben as opposed to Ben Katz. (laughs) That's what everyone calls me. So um, no, but it's actually got a tattooed on him. Slow ass. On my ass. (laughs) You'll never guess where it is. I was going to say. So I actually feel like, and maybe this is a good thing, but I feel like very little is being made of the fact that Ari Wegner is the second woman ever in the history of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to be nominated for Best Cinematography. Is it a good thing that we're not talking about that specifically because we're normalizing it? Or is it something that we should be talking about more? I think people are talking about it, but I think you're right in that I thought it would be a nonstop point of conversation. Maybe one of the things is that uh, in some of the televised award ceremonies, such as the Critics' Choice Awards, where she won, she did mm-hmm. not get to give a speech. They, pre- they just presented the award in a title card. So we haven't seen those historic moments. Uh, I thought you were going to say that Kanye went up and like yeah. took the microphone away from her and <laughs> gave a speech. Sorry. And you know, and she also saw, shot Zola last year, which mm-hmm. was an amazing looking movie. It really was. It, it has a, a certain sort of gritty realism to it that's that, you know, a lot of movies don't have. It's really it was fun for me to watch, not just because of the of the content, but because of the way it looked. So it was really I think I've talked about Zola. I think it was my short end on the on the show at one point. But but yeah, I really liked it. And her work on The Power of the Dog, I, I mean, like, again, there's nobody on this list who I saw their movie and was like, eh, like all of these movies are just stunningly good looking. The Power of the Dog, you know, is uh, Jane Campion's first movie in what, 13 years Yet, which is a long time. Yeah. And so it's her returning. And Ari told us on the show, you know, that she basically got like uh, it was I think it was an outrageous amount of prep, like nine months of prep. Wow. With Jane Campion. And to me, like one of the things that's interesting about that movie in particular, it it doesn't feel like a throwback to the 90s. But there's something about the way Jane Campion does a movie that kind of feels like a 90s indie movie, even though it's completely modern and has modern actors and, and a fresh, new, amazing look to it. But it feels like so rooted in character in a way that a lot of movies don't choose to be uh these days i and i feel like that was one of the things that ari really captured brilliantly too was kind of the characters because the lighting is very naturalistic and a lot of it was done on location but some of it was done in studio but it was it's a very naturalistic looking movie and i feel like sometimes those movies don't get their due because because it doesn't reek of effort you know Let's talk about some other uh, films, though. <laughs> Let's, uh, <laughs> well, actually, can I of... segue by saying I fully expected Ari to win at BAFTA last uh-huh. weekend? And, you know, she had the hometown. Well, I don't shouldn't say hometown advantage because it's not a British film. But Power of the Dog ended up winning Best Picture. Jane Campion won Best Director. I thought they were it was going to go along. And she actually um, it was actually Dune. Greg Frazier, nice. the one yeah, at Dune. BAFTA. So I think that's her main competition. 
Uh, well, I mean, let's let's talk about Dune. I actually uh, rewatched Dune last night, and uh, uh, Greg Greg Fraser is on a roll as a cinematographer. Yeah. I mean, and he's done so many amazing things lately. In a way, he kind of innovated how we make television. By the way, he helped to figure out the Mandalorian with all the Unreal Engine and all the stuff that they're doing, which is now rippling through all the other Star Wars kind of series. Um, you know, Book of Boba Fett, and I'm not just that- Star Wars. I'm hearing more and more about studios putting these in left and right. So this is truly becoming a way, I think, that a lot of television is going to be looking to, wow. to make, yeah. make t- TV in the future. Yeah, they can save a ton of money. They can save a ton of time and do a lot of stuff in one location. And I have to say that the stuff Greg did on The Mandalorian and a lot of the stuff in The Mandalorian has sold better visually than most other people who've touched it, including, uh, I hate to say it, Book of Boba Fett. But I feel like you can sort of tell that they're doing it in that, whereas go- I even went back and rewatched some parts of The Mandalorian. I'm like... I really can't tell. It's it's because great filmmaking kind of went into it. But in Dune, he kind of went in the opposite direction and talked about how, like, when they were in the Orna, Ornacopters, whatever they were called, they shot that for real. Like, they, they went out of their way to not do a volume, to not do green screen to not use those tricks but to to be as naturalistic as possible obviously the movie is you know loaded to the hilt with visual effects but they went for this outrageously naturalistic look i also would say that if it had come out last year i think the batman would probably also get nominated for well Best yes and i think he's getting a big boost because people are seeing the batman right now and admiring yeah. his work by the way do you know that he happened to be the director of photography on jane campion's last movie 13 years ago i did not know that yeah right he was the, he was the dp on bright star Oh shit! That's amazing. The, the, re- the only reason I know that is because he. Sh- he's, this is his second nomination after the amazing work he did on Lion. He should have been nominated for Foxcatcher. Should have mm-hmm. been nominated for Zero Dark Thirty. Should have been nominated for Bright Star. Should have been nominated for Let Me In. I think. I mean, yeah. he's this. His work is so impressive that I, I can't believe this is only his second nomination. Yeah, it is hard to believe, especially when you list it out like that, too. And just even thinking about like all these outrageously, I mean, like industry moving things he's done in, in the last few years. And in rewatching the movie, I, again, it looks the lighting is, is very naturalistic. But it's like it's interesting to think like what would naturalistic lighting look like on another <laughs> planet where the lighting was totally different, you know? Where it's seven red suns. I got to interject one thing right, right here about Greg Frazier, too, because he's won an ASC award. He's won a BAFTA. He's won an Emmy. It, if he does win for the Academy Awards, this has got to be like the EGOT of cinematography. <laughs> I was about to say, man, he just needs to win. You're absolutely right. He needs to He needs to record an album or uh, do, a, do a play. <laughs> well, I mean, that that, that 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 would be Grammy and Tony. But in the cinematography yeah. world, between BAFTA, Emmy, Academy there's Award, a lighting, it's like Tony. ASC Award. He, he could uh, do lighting for a, for I guess a stage show. I guess there's a, <laughs> there's a lighting. <laughs> You'd still have to record an album. But uh, spoken but, word. But yes, I I, I got to come up with what the what the the egot is for cinematography because because <laughs> really it's like there's four here. We should. And, ASC, yeah, he's got three of them. It's an so. ASCO. ASCO. <laughs> ASCOE. There, there needs to be a B in there. Basco. <laughs> That's great. Tobasco. Tony. Uh, if you add the Tony and you yeah, add the OB, Tony, yeah. it's Tobasco. Perfect. Well, maybe uh, we can research and see who's gotten all of them. Okay. Th- Roger Deakins. I don't know. Not gonna... <laughs> it he, took he's, got a, he's got an Emmy? I don't know if he's got an Emmy. I don't maybe know either. Does. I don't know that he's shot any television, yeah. Yeah, I think he's... It's It's got to be him or Chivo Lubeski, so... Yeah, yeah. somebody. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure this out. We'll, f- <laughs> we'll find out who, who's got the, the best go. So. <laughs> well, uh, so let's let's move on from that to uh, Nightmare Alley. Now, as total coincidence would have it, J- Janelle, you and I saw that together. Not uh, total coincidence because I'm at every damn movie, it feels like. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, I walked into that Academy screening room. I'd never been there before, and it's enormous. It's so huge. And I had only been there from the other side. I did a Q&A, so I had never actually been inside the theater in the seats and I was just like Guh, this thing is huge it's huge and it's I would say possibly the most beautiful looking movie theater screening room whatever that I've ever seen it's pretty nice like, it's, it's, it's just amazing looking amazing sounding it was a great way to see that movie now I loved Nightmare Alley and I actually went back and saw it again in the theater when before Omicron hit everybody but I sort of feel like this has sort of become the dark horse of the Oscars this year and I don't quite understand why I think the movie looks great, but pe- I just don't feel like, and maybe this is just me in my bubble, I don't feel like it's being talked about as much. The movie or the cinematography? The, the movie in general, because I feel yeah. like if the if the movie were being talked about more, the cinematography would be... Well, it's an aggressively unpleasant movie. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so. Might be why I love it. <laughs> um, it's also a remake, which doesn't always get the love it that they that yeah. they deserve. I mean, I so admire that it is Guillermo del Toro's vision and he went for it. Um, but I understand that a lot of people do not find it a pleasant experience. Hmm. Okay, I guess I'm not most people because I loved it. <laughs> I thought it was great. I thought it was a pleasant experience. Actually, yeah. I know there's some some dark themes in it, but but you know I I enjoy a good dark movie. You know I got to say though, I saw that ending coming from a mile away. <laughs> I mean, it really it is it's a classic ending. It's, mm. a, it's an ending that is steeped in like you know uh, film noir tradition. And so uh, so for and me, w- w- and I'm not going to give it away for all the people out there who still haven't seen it. Uh, you know. Yeah, you got to watch it. And if you like film noir or love film noir, you'll see that. Oh, ending my God. Kind of halfway through the movie, too. It's so. such an iconic ending that that final line that Bradley mm. Cooper speaks yeah. was the final line of the original movie. It's the final line of the book. It's the final line of the musical. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, there was a musical. I didn't know. They made, oh, they made good musical. God. Don't get me started. It was it was <laughs> bad because they only had like a cast of. Oh, actually, your friend was in it, Ben. Larry Cedar. Oh, Larry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's amazing. The cast was great, but it was like, I think it was like four actors playing all the roles. So Larry actually played um, the Mary Steenburgen role, I believe, at one point. Wow. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Yeah. And there was singing. I mean, you can make good dark musicals, honestly. That's that's not the problem. I love Assassins, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it didn't work on so many levels through no fault of the cast. The cast wasn't was amazing. Well, I have to say also, I wasn't familiar with any of the previous versions of it. And um. I'm a big, obviously, a humongous Guillermo del Toro fan. I wasn't expecting a big twist ending, so I wasn't thinking what's the twist ending coming. So I, so the ending kind of, by the time it happens, it was obvious the direction it was going in, but it, it wasn't like a holy crap, you know, big twist to me. But I will say that ever since I saw the movie, when I meet a certain kind of person, I'll uh, say t- to Alicia or maybe just myself, oh, he'll geek. Uh, <laughs> would we geek? Do you see us as geeks? No, no, People no. Would be willing to? Uh, no, no. I don't think. I don't. Th- I don't see either one of you going down the geek path. You never know. The geek path, as That's as amazing. defined by that movie, not you know, like we are all geeks, but oh, oh, the geekdom is is thick in this room. It is. It's such a testament, actually, to Dan's work and how beautiful it is. And you can, you know, the carnival is one thing, but just the scenes in Kate uh, Blanchett's office, just the lighting the way he of Kate Blanchett, her, Blanchett yeah. herself. Oh my God! You know, I did... It's really a testament to him that that he did get nominated, considering that that the movie is not that beloved. <sighs> I, I in the first scene where you see Kate Blanchett. I just remember, like, I didn't know who was in the movie when I went to see it. I knew that Bradley Cooper was in it. I didn't really know that it was nonstop amazing stars, even in teeny tiny roles. Do you? Yeah, I remember sitting next to you and like, it felt like every five minutes we were like, oh, he's in this? Right down to the very last scene. The very, very last scene of the movie has has an actor who isn't in the rest of the movie, who's an actor whose work I love. I just love. Yeah. And uh, to me, like, I, I was just eating out of that movie's hand. It's one of the things I love about Guillermo del Toro, but I think it can be a pitfall, is that his movies are all sort of homages or pastiches of other genres. And so if you're not into that genre, like, you know, uh, Crimson Peak a few years ago, which I believe Dan also shot, uh, you know, is, is a gothic romance. If you're not a fan of a gothic romance, that movie might feel like not necessarily aimed at you. And The Shape of Water was him, you know, which one best picture was him kind of doing that with 1950s horror movies, but then like really kind of going off of the pastiche and the, and the homage and letting it be its own thing a little bit more. I was just trying to re- trying to figure out why he didn't win for The Shape of Water, and then I remembered who did win. Mm. It's he, we, we dare not speak his name, but... Uh-oh. <laughs> who won? Roger Deakins. Uh, oh, well, you know, okay. Blade Runner. <laughs> well, that was the year that, that Rachel Morrison was nominated, too. I was, That's right. I was pushing for Rachel. So yeah. let's, let's move on to The Tragedy of Macbeth, which was one of the ones that I was the most excited to see, because it is a, an Ethan-less Joel Cohen directing... And also, like, not not working with Roger Deakins, their usual DP. Uh, he's working with Bruno Del Bonnell, who I believe they did. I, didn't he shoot Inside Lewin Davis? Uh, yes, he did. And more importantly, Amelie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing cinematographer. Some really bold, strong, interesting choices. Black and white. Uh, narrow aspect ratio, which we're seeing a lot more people doing the, the four by three aspect ratio, which, you know, it, it's almost like a weird retro thing to kind of the German expressionism that they're that they're trying to emulate just a, a, a killer cast like what were your thoughts on Macbeth um I believe okay so I get in trouble every time I say this I am not the hugest fan of this as a play 
mm-hmm. and everybody's like, what? It's an all time classic. And I'm like, eh, have you really read it or seen it? Because characters make big mood shifts mm-hmm. out of nowhere that are justified. Like suddenly Lady Macbeth is like, she feels so guilty for what she's been working for this entire time. She like throws herself off a cliff. Yeah. No. So I went in with, I think it was, it was best that I went in with sort of lowered expectations. I really liked it. I thought he kept it really lean. I loved the sets, the way, I, I loved what he did with the witches. Yeah. Um, having that one was actress inc- play all of them. That was insane. Was amazing. It was and, just beautiful. Yeah. Catherine Hunter should have been nominated for supporting actress, mm. honestly. Yeah. I, well, a lot of times I see Shakespeare adaptations and they feel like there's a lot of padding. Yeah. And, there, and this was lean and mean. And obviously the actors are fantastic. And I was, I really, really enjoyed it. It was very arch. Yes. Ilya, what, what were your thoughts about it? Well, it's black and white. I'm a sucker for black and white. I, I wish there was more things made in black and white. I don't know. Well, there know. were a lot this year. <laughs> there was. And and it, and it was, you know, it was a feast for me. We'll talk about Belfast in a second. But I mean, it's... Um, Another one that, that didn't get nominated and probably should have. I, I don't get the four by three of... I, I mean, I, I gotta come out and say, I just don't get it. The Tragedy of Macbeth, to me, there's all these sweeping vistas. There's all this grandeur. There's all these, you know, high contrast, wonderful sort of like set pieces that involve these, you know, the, all kinds of architecture and, and moments and close-ups and this, that. And I kind of feel like it could have all gloriously been in another format that I would have, I would have enjoyed it more. I didn't feel like it had, I didn't feel like it served the story. So that, that's my, that's my takeaway. Interesting. Well, I mean, like we've been seeing a lot of movies like The Lighthouse. I'm, I'm blanking on the other ones, but I've seen it a few times lately where they've gone with the four by three aspect ratio. And it's an interesting choice. And I think it works very well for some things. But this movie just in particular to me, it, I didn't get it. Uh, if there were, if it was one criticism that I was going to make about it, it, it's that I felt like this deserved to be gloriously seen on a, on a wide canvas. And uh, instead, I, I, I got a little cropped canvas. So, hmm. Interesting. I sort of went in, uh, Janelle, with a similar feeling to you because I've seen several adaptations of Macbeth. Well, you and I have seen the same not very good uh, Macbeth adaptation together, so that might have affected. Well, that's true, too. Um, (laughs) But like I've also like uh, I don't like saying positive things generally about Roman Polanski, but his version of Macbeth, I thought his movie of Macbeth, I thought was extremely good and visceral. I don't know. I mean, you know, say what you will about the guy. He knows how to make a movie. But there hasn't really been a Macbeth that I thought kind of supplanted that cinematically in my mind. And I also didn't understand the attraction of Joel Cohen to the material. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, he's kind of turning them into Shakespeare's version of a couple of stupid mooks pl- plotting a scheme <laughs> to steal a bunch of stuff. Like, I get it now. Like, it, like I, I completely got why it, it was his thing. And it, it took itself a little seriously and definitely went into the German expressionism uh, pretty hardcore, which I think is why uh, the aspect ratio. I think that that's where could, that could comes be. from. Could be, um, could be, you know, <laughs> hearkening to Nosferatu, but you know, I wouldn't have made that direct connection if you didn't just say so. Well, it's the way it's lit and the kind of angles they use to me feel like straight up German expressionism. I don't know. I mean, I very much enjoyed it, and I thought it was it was gorgeous. And because we're still kind of in this pandemic, it was one of the movies that unfortunately I wasn't able to go see. On a big screen. In fact, did I see any of these on a big screen? No, I did not. I saw all of these on a big screen TV, but not uh, not. But he saw a net on a big screen like three times. Twice, twice. I saw a net twice Mm. on a big screen. Yeah, that's true. Uh, So should we talk about that hack, Kaminsky? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, Well, you've interviewed him and we haven't, so I guess you can. I didn't actually interview him. I met him. I had to. Yeah, I met him at. I I was doing a Q and A, and he came to like the little after event, and it was a very brief meeting, and I did. I was like. What am I going to say to this guy? I'm like, you make things look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and just, can I get a selfie? <laughs> uh, that was I almost like that... the Barney Rebel. Like, you know, <laughs> it was like a... <laughs> it's pretty good, Janelle. Well, I, I think <laughs> if, if I had my Steven Spielberg moment again, uh, I might ask him because he had worked with a number of DPs before he started working with Janusz Kaminski. And I believe his first film with him was Schindler's List. It was. And yeah. he hasn't worked with another cinematographer since, to my knowledge. You know, what's interesting, too, is he has Kaminsky has seven Academy Award nominations. There's only one movie that wasn't with Spielberg that he was nominated for. And that's mm. Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Mm, beautiful mm. film, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really interesting cinematography in that, too. Jeez. Yeah. Weirdly, he wasn't nominated for Bridge of Spies, which mm. I absolutely loved. But I, I think a lot of people kind of don't remember. And yet he was nominated for War Horse, which is a beautiful looking movie. But 
I just think Bridge of Spies is, is such a superior movie in every way. Well, and the thing about West Side Story is like when I first heard that Spielberg was remaking West Side Story, I kind of asked myself, why would you do that? Yep. Uh, like a lot of people did. And, you know, uh, this year we had In the Heights, a Lin-Manuel Miranda movie that's in a Puerto Rican neighborhood in New York. And it's not the same as West Side Story at all, but it's more modern and it's kind of coming from the actual community that's depicted in West Side Story as written by a bunch of white people. And But when I watched West Side Story, I was like, I totally get it. I, I actually I was one of those people who uh. who was who was taken in by it. And I th- and I thought it was uh I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I went in with low expectations, but, you know, Spielberg still got it. And Janusz Kaminski is like firing on all cylinders. It is such a beautiful film. I went into West Side Story in the worst mood. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, why did they remake this? Oh, you know, the blah, 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 blah. Took me too long to get here. Parking's <laughs> terrible. It started and within like the first two minutes, like I was just like, I was like you seeing Sparks. I was yeah. just like, oh. I, yeah. I was so happy. I had the biggest grin on my face. I, I really, really loved it. And by the way, um, do you know Janus uh, started in horror films? He started with Roger Corman. Yeah. If we ever yeah. get and him then, on the show, I'm only going to talk to him about Roger Corman. That's what we did to Fade and Papa Michael. That's what we did to Wally Fister. All I'm going to want to know is no, about his Roger Corman no. days. No, we're also going to talk to him about Cool as Ice. Thank cool, that's uh, cool yeah. as I ice. was just we'll going to, to say, cool as, he went from Cool as Ice Wait, to West Side Story. Did he go Story. from Zero to Hero? Oh my goodness. (laughs) Okay, so I'm all in on West Side Story. And and I'll tell you that uh, for me, it was really interesting because uh, I saw West Side Story as a kid and I kind of liked it, but I maybe, it it wasn't my favorite musical. It wasn't one that I wanted to revisit. I have probably not seen West Side Story, the original, in 30 years. Now, I also did not think it's a movie that necessarily, you know, warranted or needed a remake. But within five minutes, I was like, holy crap, I get it. I get it. And Spielberg... (laughs) <laughs> and Janish, they were so great. They absolutely felt like they were working at the pinnacle, the top of their game. It would not surprise me if they do get tons of awards lavished upon them because it's really good. It's really solid. And in, in many ways to me, it totally eclipses the original. And, I agree. Uh, uh, God, I, I, it's so good. It's so good. If there is an upset in the director category because it's been Jane Campion sweeping all along, I think it's Spielberg. Especially because now the movie is on HBO Max. Yeah. And people are actually seeing it. And I feel like a lot of people just didn't see it. It came out late. Um, There's some problems with the screeners, I heard. Yeah, it's pretty funny to call Spielberg the spoiler. I know, right? (laughs) Well, I also feel like that's the thing is that, you know, Spielberg has been around since the early 70s. He's been making movies that were Oscar consideration bait, let's say, since the early 80s and has been consistently winning since the 90s. So he just sort of feels like a public utility. And we forget he's like this guy who likes telling stories and making movies. And he puts his all in, you know, like when he makes it, man, he he puts his all into all the movies. I'm not going to say I love every movie he makes, but I think it's easy to take people like him for granted because he's just like part of the firmament here. Like, you know, when you think about the influence, name one person who's had a bigger influence on Hollywood in Hollywood history. I don't think I don't think there is one. Stanley Kubrick. No, I don't agree. No. I don't think. I mean, I okay. think Stanley Kubrick's well, a freaking genius. Well, and he made some awesome movies, but like, I think he's had a big influence. I don't know if it was the same commercial success, but he said name someone. I, 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 don't I, know. I can't. The first I mean, ma- name that comes but to like, mind. But think about like what he did for like uh, creating DreamWorks or creating uh, like what he's done with Amblin or it's true or it's uh, true creating TV series uh, uh, is, is stuff like the Animaniacs that you don't even think about that no, it, like no, you're, that he is behind that stuff. You're a hundred percent right. You're hundred percent. And he right. is the first director. To be nominated as best director in six different decades. Wow. wow. Yeah. He was previously tied, I believe, with Martin Scorsese for consistently being nominated in five decades. What was he nominated for in the 70s? Was it Close Encounters? Jaws. No, he was nominated for Jaws. That was the big. I don't know if you've ever seen that video where he's not nominated for Jaws. Yeah. Yeah, um, it would have to be Close uh, Encounters. Must right? have to be Close Encounters, I would think. Because yeah. I know he was not. Or I think he was nominated for Raiders, but he was nominated for a bunch of stuff in the '80s. Like I think yeah. by the time the '80s came around, it was like this is this is our guy. Like he's he's going to win, and and there are people like him and Scorsese who take way longer than they should to to get that honor. It was Close Encounters, Close yeah. Encounters, and then Raiders of the Lost Ark, yeah. E.T., Color Purple, yeah, Schindler's List. It was when he finally won, and then Saving Private Ryan, he won again, and then it's been. Munich, which I can't stand. Letters from Iwo Jima, War Horse, Lincoln. Uh, oh, he wasn't, sorry, sorry. He wasn't nominated for Bridge of Spies for directing. 
or for the post. Mm-hmm. The post is when uh, you introduced me to him. That's right. And that was the last time. And then we sang happy birthday to him. No, we, ben the whole crowd. pulled out his phone and was like, let me just get a selfie. <laughs> Click. Here's, here's how I remember that story, by the way. We were at the DGA and I had driven you there and I had already seen the post on a screener. And you and I were kind of hanging out, but you left the room. And I, I was uh, sitting in the lobby at the DGA at the table that you were at. And a guy came up and he's like, hey, uh, where am I supposed to check in? My name's Gary. And, I, and my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, Gary Rydstrom the sound designer of like every major Spielberg Lucas, like possibly one of the biggest sound designers who ever lived. And I was like, holy crap. Of course, I'm in the room with all of these people. And then you waved me in and said, come on in here. And I walked in and you were talking to Spielberg and I was trying to like hang back and you were like, Ben's shy. And he was like, hi, Ben. (laughs) And I, I don't think this really happened at all, but I felt every eye in the room like, hey, idiot, go over there. And I also knew that for a fact, there's like nothing I can say that's going to interest or impress him. So I just was friendly and let him talk. Do you remember what I said to him? First of all, I never knew that part about about you being in the lobby beforehand and and, and seeing the other guy. Yeah, Gary Rydstrom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Re- I don't remember because I was in a haze of having shaken his geniusy velvety hand and uh, you know, like basking in in his light for those few minutes. It's actually a really nice gesture on his part. I was thanking him because when he was nominated for Lincoln. He sent gift baskets to all of his fellow nominees. Oh, yeah. Yes. And I was house sitting for one of those nominees and ended up eating everything in the gift basket <laughs> because because they were out of town. They were, no, you know, they yeah, were coming. It was going to go yeah. bad. You had, and you so was, I had. Was, yeah. Yeah. I was you were like doing him a service. Yes, right. yes. I was thanking him for this amazing gift basket. And it was like the want first time I tried waste. caviar. And I just remember saying, like, that was so nice of you, you know, to send that to all of your competitors. And he was like, we are a group like. You know, we got to look out for each other. We're, I don't know if he used the word union, but he was like, you know, we understand each other. And I mean, we're we were saying we were having this conversation at the Directors Guild building. So, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> yeah. And he, he was very matter of fact, like, well, of course, like, you know, why wouldn't I have? He said something also at that Q&A, not, not to dwell on this too much, but I've quoted it so many times. So I feel like people who listen to this podcast might get as much out of it as I did. But somebody asked him about the collaborative process and how much do you win? How much do you lose when you have an idea and you go in and bring it with all these people? He's like, and he said something to the effect of like, if you want to have complete control of your work, paint a painting mm-hmm. like this. This is a group sport. And it was uh, great hearing basically somebody who, if Steven Spielberg said, I want to paint all of Van Nuys purple tomorrow, it would be purple. You know, whatever he wants gets done. The fact that that he he seems like a genuinely generous, collaborative person, you know, shows to me like obviously somebody like Janusz Kaminski is going to want to work with Spielberg. But why do you want to basically make a career of working with Spielberg? Probably because he's awesome to work with. Mm. Actually, a lot of these DPs are working with people that I can certify as awesome and like really cool, like Denny Villeneuve, mm-hmm. such a nice guy. Guillermo del Toro, yeah, notoriously oh, nice yeah. guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, del Toro is brilliant. It only makes sense that they that they would. And again, like it was, it wasn't the first time Bruno Del Bonel had worked with uh, with Joel Cohen. I'm just still kind of like personally experiencing like a, you know the world shook moment that it was just Joel Cohen because <laughs> I'm so used to seeing sort of their combined effort and I. Because it's because Shakespeare is so in the foreground of a Macbeth adaptation, it's hard to go, well, what would it have been like if Ethan Cohen had co-directed it? I really couldn't tell you. Can I say the one nominee I would have really liked to have seen here is mm-hmm. Robert Elswit for King Richard? Interesting. Yeah, I thought he did an amazing job the way he shot the the final game and then just I mean, I, uh, this is not someone this is not some up and comer who needs attention. You know, I'm yeah, yeah. obviously talking about a brilliant DP, but that no, that we had him on the pick. show to talk about it. Yeah. Oh. he uh, King Richard is amazing. You know, one that I was surprised didn't get uh, the nomination was uh, Seamus McGarvey for Cyrano. The thing I loved the most about Cyrano was yeah. the way it looked. Cyrano got no love and it bums me out because I really liked it. I'm I'm a little surprised that it didn't get more attention, but also like, you know, sometimes these things are also like the Lifetime Achievement Award if you've done enough work. And I feel like Seamus is someone who has done so much amazing work. And then Cyrano, I just thought, looked gorgeous. And when we were talking to him about it, I just remember sort of being overwhelmed with like how much fun he was obviously having yeah. making it. 
because I feel like sometimes this stuff feels like dour, somber, like we got to get through X pages, blah, 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 like push, push, push. And like him talking about him and the director goofing around with flashlights and getting kind of wacky effects in the camera. I'm like, God, that like it, it, it just felt like pure fun to make. Was there anyone, Ilya, that you felt you know was overlooked? Uh, again, I'm not saying that I would knock any of these uh, nominees out of this category, but like, was there anyone who you would have liked to have seen get some love? Hmm. I, I wish I had someone really witty, and I could say that like that neither of you Paul just Thomas named. Anderson. Uh, you know, Licorice Pizza does does look look very nice. It looks nice. freaking fantastic. <laughs> oh, and, and well, sorry, I'll throw the other one out there. Spencer, the DP on Spencer. That movie looked amazing. Oh, as well. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I. I think Robert Ellswit, I think he did a really great job and I really enjoyed talking to him about King Richard. And I mean, Will Smith has got to be like riding high right now, too, after winning a SAG award, after winning a BAFTA. I mean, could this be his year? Do you think he's going to yes. win the Oscar? You think it's coming? When I saw that movie in July, I was like, this is it. Nobody beats this guy. I thought for a while there, uh, I mean, anything could happen. Um, I thought Andrew Garfield and Benedict Cumberbatch were going to give him some competition, but I think it's got to be Will all the way. Yeah, I, I think Interesting. it's a good chance for sure. So, Ilya, you brought up Belfast. Do you think that that one uh, belonged uh, in this in this category? I do. I really liked Belfast. I'm a real sucker for black and white. I really I enjoyed the way the movie looked so much. I, I love that it wasn't afraid to embrace realism over almost anything else. And I love that there was, you know, a deeper depth of field. It wasn't all about just trying to put the world out of focus. You can really see what, what's going on. It's a pandemic movie, but it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like that. It's got a large cast. It's, you know, it's, it's really well put together. It tells an intimate story. I think it, it definitely deserves to be there. I think it's a, it's a beautiful movie. So let's kind of get to uh, our predictions here. And uh, Janelle, as you pointed out, uh, we're we're having this conversation before the AFC Awards, which is a huge bellwether of who might actually win. Uh, yeah, I predicted Mank last year. Yeah, I was I was very excited that Mank won. It was I was excited. At, but we just all assumed it would be Nomadland because yeah, yeah it was it, also beautifully shot and obviously winning Best Picture and sweeping several awards. So. Well, and it also made sense that I don't think anyone, and I don't mean to say this, I, I am the biggest David Fincher fan alive, but I don't think that anyone was predicting David Fincher was going to win for Mank. And so I feel like the fact that it won cinematography is sort of a nod to what made it great and without giving Fincher the award necessarily. So just again, to remind everybody, the five films that are nominated, Dune, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, The Tragedy of Macbeth, West Side Story, Ilya, who do you think takes the gold? <sighs> I, I think it, it might be Ari Wagner. It might be. Yeah, I think, I think that there's, there, there's people talking about it. Dune also could, could easily be there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Who, who do you think? Well, who do you think, Janelle? My heart is with Ari Wagner. My head mm-hmm. is telling me Greg Frazier. Um, mm-hmm. But I will firmly predict whoever wins ASC. Hmm. All right. If good Ben can um, edit this a little bit, I predict Ari Wigner and then throw in, I predict Greg Frazier. So I feel like uh, I'm going to get caught up in the sweep here and I'm going to say Ari Wigner is going to, uh, I believe that she will win. I would not be sad if any of these people won. I think that all of them made, you know, just amazing looking films. I think this was a great year for movies, too. Uh, weirdly, in a pandemic year where, like, I think probably most of these movies got finished during the pandemic. You know, they still managed to make stuff that I think is, it's a pretty memorable year for movies. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You know, we have we have years that, that are and years that aren't. I think this is, this is a, a pretty strong... Uh, lineup Take, taking nothing away from Minari, but uh, but really, it's a really strong year this year. It's really amazing. I mean, like, I mean, really, it's it, I don't know. It, it's like there was a bunch of stuff that was held back, and then voila, it's like here come all the studio blo- blockbusters. It was, it's yeah. a, it's a definitely a different vibe from last year. It is, it is. Well, I mean, like last year, I, we were just still so in the grips of the pandemic, and most people hadn't had an opportunity to get vaccinated, and production was all stalled out. And I feel like now you know people even feel more safe going to movie theaters finally and hopefully it stays that way i don't know i keep hearing about this new variant but that's that's for another day to be worried about and well but on that note though janelle doing uh q and a's as you do have you seen a change in the live uh turnout for people coming to going to q and a's to see these um, you know, amazing people talk about their work uh people were really excited to be back out and screenings were full and then december came and omicron yeah. hit and 
I think there was also a little bit of just general fatigue in addition to that fear. Um, and things really shut down for like six weeks. They kind of came back in February. And, it, you know, and like the one thing I will say uh, is that Dune still packs them in. You mm-hmm. get people who have seen that movie multiple times and they show up for a Q&A even when it's, um, you know, below the line people. It's not necessarily any of the stars or not even Denis. I've noticed that like Coda, if people are mm-hmm. like a lot of people didn't see it and they're just now starting to see it. That's one that's picked up a lot of steam. I think, oh, no, no, I did Power of the Dog recently. And I will say there was a massive turnout and I asked everyone who has seen this movie for the first time and it was over half the audience. And a lot of them were telling me afterwards that they knew they needed to see the movie. They really wanted to see the movie. They were waiting to see it on a big screen. So they were waiting for an event like this. And that's a big question that that I keep having is like a lot of these movies, Dune being one of them, where it's like it premiered, it it started playing in theaters and the same day you could watch it on HBO Max. Still a lot of people saw it in theaters. Yeah. Made a lot of money and... uh... Yeah, they're, they've had a lot of screenings starting since October, so, yeah. Well, let me just interject this one bit of good news, but we've had almost an entire week now in Los Angeles where the positivity rate for COVID is under 1%. I mean, today it was yeah. like 0.82%, wow. and and that's just phenomenal. I, I can't say that we're out of the woods because I hear, like, Europe and some other places right now, which are really having, like, a, a terrible resurgence. Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong had, like, it got shut down oh again. Oh, my God, it was yeah. like, and it was only six, eight weeks ago we were, like, at that point here, too, and... And yeah. it's amazing that, you know, people wore some masks and people got vaccinated and voila, we're really, really low, at least at least in L.A. It's pretty amazing. Well, every screening I've got, even just like when I went to see The Batman uh, a couple of weeks ago in a regular old movie theater, they were checking vaccination cards yep. on the way in and they would not let you in if you didn't ha- have a vaccination. Uh, it didn't need to be a card. You could have the app on your phone. But the you theater had I went to wouldn't let you in without a booster. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. You had to be vaxxed and boosted. And I was that, really that impressed. Was the case like when I saw uh, Sparks in concert at the Disney concert. Oh, Hall, did you see Sparks? Yeah, yeah. We went, Alicia and I went, uh, I, this is a little embarrassing. We saw them both nights. Dude, I'm teasing you because <laughs> you've already talked about it several times. Yes. Yeah. Oh, shut up. Uh, That's fair. Th- th- this is fun. What no one can, at home can see right now is what shade of red Ben is. Because you know, <laughs> he's completely red. It's just, he's, he's, re- he's such a Sparks geek that, and Janelle just basically busted him on it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Well. It was funny, uh, you know, I, I did several Zooms with Sparks and Simon Helberg for that movie, and uh, they always commented on my puppets behind <laughs> me, and they're like, of course you like this movie, look at all your puppets. <laughs> <laughs> Only someone really into puppets would like our movie. Like, what, what does that mean? What's Didn't that? hurt. <laughs> Didn't, <laughs> Didn't take away from Somebody, it. As into musicals and puppets as you, yes. <laughs> Uh, all right. So what else do we need to talk about, about the Academy Award? Nothing. Um, it's way past my bedtime. I was about to wrap it up. Well, before we go, though, Janelle, uh, where can people find your uh, your work or interact with you online in any place that you would like to send them? Go to Twitter at Janelle Riley, J-E-N-E-L-L-E-R-I-L-E-Y. Is that where you post the selfies? Yes, <laughs> okay. actually, it is. It is when I take them. I, actually, I don't usually take selfies because usually someone is taking the photo. Someone's taking the photo. Yeah. But it, it's Getty images. It's, yeah. you know, it's someone very, yeah. I put Way that fake classier. logo on there that, to, you know. That, that's right. Um, yeah, you, can, so you can buy this picture for $595. <laughs> Well, uh, go check that out, and uh, hopefully next year when we do this again, none of the three of us will have died of COVID, and there will be no pandemic to speak of. Oh, oh that'd be wonderful. Yeah, but we can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh unironically on ironically at that joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> well, Janelle, it was, it was always great to have you on, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Janelle. Thanks for having me. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.